Hey everybody, what is up? I am just getting my uh, Instagram going as well. We're going to be doing these live streams in tandem so that we can get you guys all involved if that's possible. I've got to adjust mic a little bit here. So bear with me just one second on YouTube. Um, I set you guys up first. Now I'm working on Instagram live. All right. We are live on Instagram and YouTube. Hey, what is up? My name is Eric McGrew. I am the owner and operator of Elevated Office Podcast, as well as Eric's Tree Service in Montrose, Colorado. And um, today I'm going to come to you because I am going to be talking a little bit about some of the business side. Um, it was asked of me to to talk about you guys about how to deal with clients and stuff um, and how I deal with my problematic clients. So that's what we're going to talk to you guys about. Um, hey, Mars Gia. Uh, Mars is a Patreon member. He uh, helps. He has subscribed to Patreon. So he is helping me out, which is very cool. Um, something new for the Instagram live guys. So if you guys are on YouTube, uh, just know I have been doing lives on Instagram for a while and, um, they get good response. I'm getting about, uh, 500 views in a week, uh, sometimes over a thousand in a week. Uh, so I was mentioning everybody who was joining. Um, but Recently, some people said too many people are joining and it gets old to hear you say hi to everybody. So that is, um, I can see that it makes it hard to make these into my podcast episodes saying hi to everybody as well. So if you're on Instagram, if you're on YouTube, thank you for joining. Um, I'm not going to say hi to everybody. I do know that uh, like um, Dak just said, evening, Eric. So thank you. If you do comment, please keep them, uh, PG. All of my settings are PG and it helps Google, uh, share my stuff to a wider audience. So keep that in mind. And if you are commenting on either Instagram or Facebook and you comment something that is in the blocked words, it may not come up. So keep that in mind as well before we get going. Uh, want to say thank you to everybody who's already joining. I really appreciate it. Um, so to begin with, I must mention that, of course, Elevated Office is uh, sponsored by WeaverArborist.com, JustSendItSauls.com, GapArboristSupply.com, and of course, we are affiliated with ArbShirts.com. I have an affiliation with ArbShirts.com. If you haven't gone by ArbShirts.com, um, please do so. I'm putting it in the chat right now. And so uh, it is run by an arborist. And he makes some cool shirts that you can buy, which are really neat. Um, but also there is a topic under there that is Elevated Office. Those are my designs that I've actually put together, like this one here. I know it reads backwards, but it says uh, it has the Zubat on it, and it says user under it. Um, if you buy these shirts, then I get a small percentage of what you guys buy. So it just helps support everything that I'm doing with all this content. So thank you, guys. Um, hopefully, this is coming through clear on uh, YouTube. To be quite frank with you, I haven't used this mic set up directly through YouTube Live, so I'm trying my best to give you guys a good sound and content. Um, so Ruben Craighead also just joined. He's also a Patreon member. If you want to be a Patreon member, you can go and check out my Patreon page. And of course, you will get shout outs because you are producers of my show with me. You are helping me pay to keep this running. So that's awesome. Um, Andrew Cooper says, howdy. Ruben Craighead says, howdy. Um, Let's see. Uh, K Chap said, good guy right here. Evening, Eric. Hey, everybody. Thank you for stopping by. All right. So with all of that out, hey, Chris Branstrom says, sounds good, Eric. Thank you, Chris. Good to see you, man. Hadn't seen you in a long time. Chris is a longtime friend of mine. We went snowboarding in Colorado before I ever lived here. He's from New York originally. Now he lives in Hawaii and super cool dude. So um, just, you know, how it goes, long-term friends it's hard to keep in touch sometimes when we move away. So thank you, Chris. Good to see you, man. Um, so the, the topic tonight, well, let me rephrase. Um, I'm going to get into that topic. I don't want to mislead you guys, 
But I do have to get into um, a comment that was made on Instagram because, you know, if you want to get critiqued, post online. So, um, and I, I don't mind, I don't mind the criticisms and the critiques, uh, especially if they're positive. This one was borderline, but I'm going to read it to you anyway. Um, let me see if I can find my comments. So this one was from monster R stump. I want to say is Mark Weber tree says, what's up? What's up, Mark? Good to see you guys. Um, so, uh, let's see what's going on here. It's not working for some reason. I'm trying to get to my, my messages on line. I mean, my, um, actions or, you know, reactions online. So, uh, bear with me guys. Don't get bored of me yet. I've got a lot to talk about tonight. Oh, uh, it's not coming up, but mm, Monster R Stump, I want to say it was, said something along the lines of, if you've not known, I have a um, a live Instagram that, uh, nice to see you too, um, Seabot. It's awesome, man. Um, so I did a live Instagram a few weeks ago, and I was talking about concepts for beginners to look at, uh, climbing trees. And one of the concepts that I mentioned was trying to um, trying to work out a plan for using your safety, your life safety lanyard for your second tie-in point. And I made a hypothetical and theoretical comment that if you are tied into a less than strong enough branch and you accidentally cut your climbing line then even though it's working for work position, it probably wouldn't be strong enough to be life support. Okay. Um, evidently, I think his name is Bob, but Monstar Stump uh, took offense to that statement and says, how many people have you ever known to cut their climb line? Okay. I get it. He's, he's right. I don't know of many. I do, unfortunately, because of the position I'm in with the industry, with the different data that I get, I've seen some numbers and it's actually more common than you would think. Okay. To be, to be quite frank, um, it's kind of crazy, but it is a little bit, um, disconcerting how many people have, uh, cut their line to a point of failure and you have to have your lanyard, um, working. And, um, the, the fact of the matter also is, is that, I, I kind of portrayed it in the concept of being on a sprawling branch and you having your work position lanyard over here and your climb line over here. In those cases, most likely you're not going to cut your climb line. Realistically, it could still happen. And I'm going to give you a scenario. If you carry your handsaw on your hip, like your silky, you pull it out and you have to come within close range of your climb line. And a very quick and easy way to cut your climb line in half, fully in half while under tension is with your handsaw, even more so than your chainsaw. Honestly, um, it's amazing how quickly those things cut. So while he has a kind of valid point, I don't take back what I said. And I, I think that people, if they are thinking somewhat reasonably, should be able to understand a hypothetical statement, but the fact does not change. The industry says we should have two tie-in points that are life rated or life safety because of that. Um, it's not just positioning. So if you don't agree with that, then you that's your life standard that you have to deal with. I, I don't really care, but I'm not going to change the statement because it's an accurate statement. So let's go over really quickly though. What a couple of things Mark Weber first off asked, sorry guys, interrupting. He says, how does the new harness fit? I'll have to talk about that later, Mark. Um, and then, uh, Mark says, I agree with you. And, um, so if I missed waving at you, please know waving at you on Instagram is equivalent of saying hi. I'm just going on with topics. So keep that in mind. Um, so there are a few situations that could occur that would potentially put you in a situation of life safety where your lanyard has to be your, um, your backup. Okay. And it has nothing to do with cutting your line in the moment, I should say. So what are these situations? Well, one, 
quite frankly, is the fact that most climbers do not maintenance, nor do they inspect, nor do they replace climb lines as frequently as they should. The grit and gravel and not gravel, but you know, sand, grit, that kind of stuff gets inside the, the outer sheathing and starts to wear the inner core. Most climbers do not inspect their climbing rope before or after each climb. I, to be quite frank with you, I'm remiss at um, checking it as frequently as I should be. And I'm working really hard to get better at that because we get in, we get in the mindset. We got to get in the tree. We got to get it done. We throw a line. We get up in there, we get done. And then now we've got to do cleanup and we're tired and we just pack everything away and go right. Well, with time, if not checked, you could totally, totally accidentally be climbing on a line that has a flat spot in it where almost all the interior coring has been deteriorated and just the right kind of impact could split it enough to where your life safety has to be your lanyard. Okay. And something that happened, um, recently to a friend of mine was that he was actually on a redirect with his main line. And thankfully enough, he had a life safety lanyard, um, that was rate. I mean, it was like substantial to hold him, but the redirect actually split off in the tip. And here was the thing. The tree looked sound, had leafage, didn't have splitting, didn't have whatever. All the heartwood was rotten out. It was a cottonwood. And the tip of the branch, which was about five inches in diameter. So it wasn't even the tip. It was like 10 or 15 feet from the tip inward where his um, lifeline was for redirect. It just broke off and got tangled in his lifeline. And now he plus this branch are hanging from his lanyard. And he had nothing to do with him getting close to his lifeline and accidentally cutting it. So that's another aspect. So um, the other thing is we all at some point have or will have nicked our climbing line with our handsaw or a chainsaw. It's just how it is. If, you, if you've if you never nicked your climbing line, then you don't climb it enough. And uh, it happens to almost everybody, right? I don't know of anybody who has happened to. But the thing of it is, is that when that happens, a lot of times we look at it, we inspect it and we say, oh, it's still good enough and we'll climb on it. Well, if we don't keep inspecting that and it keeps getting abraded by bark or whatever, then it could continue to open up and it may not be safe any longer. And then that line could let go. And now we're left with our life safety line. And to anybody who says, who do you know that that's happened to? Just go back and read last year's accident report from TCIA and Trebus. You will see at least that I know of two or three where life lines failed and people were seriously, um, hurt. Um, so lot cable lanyards are not rated for life support. Yes or no. Um, <laughs> I, I don't want to get into that. Uh, they are considered a life assistance device. Um, but I don't have enough info on the actual rating of those because there's a bunch of factors to the, the cable lanyards. Um, I know a lot of people use them as such. I don't like to use cable land, like the wire core lanyards as life support, but if they're in good condition, I think they can double as an emergency life support. I wouldn't say that it should be your standard. Um, I, I wouldn't say it should be your standard for a bunch of factors, but that's the quick and short of that, Mark. I'm not going to get into that too deep because for me to say something like that as a representative of different companies, I'd have to actually look up all the detail and and see what ANSI says on the on the mark. Um, so just, yeah, don't forget, ANSI is your guide. Go to ANSI and OSHA, check them out. Um, once again, as they'll tell you in every, you'll get so sick of hearing it. When you start any um, training course, you will be told these ANSI standards have been written in blood. And it's true. Um, somebody major had an accident or died or something, and it was why they wrote the standard. So always, re, you know, if you're in doubt, go back to ANSI Z133, check that out, or the other ANSI standards that apply to the work conditions that you are dealing with, okay? before. So I don't really want to say yes or no, definitely. I prefer not to use them as life-only support, they are definitely a backup to me. Um, 
Dak says, pretty sure most rope grabs have warnings that specifically say not rated for vertical life support. Yes. Um, which is kind of weird for wire core lanyards. Yeah. I, I think, it, I think, and this is total speculation. So don't quote me on this. I think it's because of the mixed construction of them um, with the wire, the rope sheathing, you know, the, the fiber sheathing on the outside with the fiber wire core on the inside. Um, but I, I don't climb with steel core at all. Um, here's a little known fact real quickly on the whole lanyard situation. Uh, while chainsaws won't easily cut all the way through a, lan a wire core lanyard, they tip they technically can. While they won't easily cut all the way through, what they will do is they will split the outer rope sheath. And once that tears all the way around, it'll just slip off with your rope grab or your prusik on it. Okay. Um, so don't, if you nick it, don't keep climbing on it because you think that the wire core isn't cut and it's going to be safe. It's actually that outer sheathing that gives you the grip for your prusik or your rope grab. So definitely get off of that if you cut it pretty quickly. Um, and by Nick, I don't mean like it's gotten fuzzy because it got abraded. You have to, you have to determine that on your own, but I'm saying if you definitely cut through the outer sheathing, be careful. Okay. Just so you know. Um, but yeah, so I stand by what I say of the lanyards. If you're going to use only one lanyard, it should be in my opinion. And this is my opinion for the standard of life safety and work positioning around something substantial enough to support your life if for some reason your climb line is affected. And never forget, we always talk about what happens in the canopy, but the reality of it is a lot of stuff can happen on the ground that could affect your basal tie as well. Maybe um, I actually heard of an instance where somebody was climbing on a line recently and they didn't realize somebody was on the line and they released the basal. Um, and that's not good. So that's where your life support would come into play as a, as a lanyard, as a secondary. Now, if you're climbing and you're in a void of air between branches or from the ground to the canopy and somebody releases it, you're probably not going to have a lanyard on and you're just where you're at. Right. So, um, yeah, it, it can happen. Also, I have heard not recently, this was in the past. I have heard that somebody accidentally got too close to the climbing tree with a mini skid and the pressure of the bucket against the tree cut the lifeline. So there are unusual and yes, it's carelessness. I'm not even going to deny this. If those, if those situations are occurring, it's because somebody wasn't paying close enough attention. But the fact of the matter is, is they can occur. And for us to sit there and say, Oh no, that'll never happen to us. Then the, the reality of it is, is that we are being naive. We're being overly confident. We're being complacent about the work that we're doing and we're being naive. So, um, just let that know. Uh, somebody asked me, how old am I? Okay. Well, I am 39 years old, just so you guys know. So I'll actually type that in the, in the comments down here. Why may I ask why you ask Jay? Just out of curiosity. Or John, John Pierre, Jake, why why do you ask how old I am? Just out of curiosity. Um. Anyway, so yeah, keep that in mind. Okay, so I still hold to the fact, and I will leave that video up. It's only about fifteen minutes. It's probably a pretty good. Um, it's not just for beginners, even though it is definitely something for beginners to think about before they start climbing trees. It's something that I think a lot of you guys can benefit from. Um. So go go, please check that out. And I think you'll like that. So let's get on to the next part, which is how do I deal with difficult clients? So difficult clients become a whole topic, right? Um, and like any topic, there's so many niche areas of difficulty. Are they difficult because they are holding payment ransom for some work that they want you to do that they feel like you haven't done or that they felt was in the agreement that you didn't didn't do? Um, are they difficult because you can't live up to the expectations that they had of what the end result would look like? Um, are they difficult? 
Okay, Chris. Good to see you, Seabot. Um, I'm I'm glad you did say hi, bro. Take care, man. Be safe out there. Um, so is it uh is it something like a you're not going fast enough, you didn't get to the job quick enough? There's all kinds of scenarios. And so let me talk to you about two scenarios I deal with regularly. Okay. And I don't deal with payment issues that much. Um, a lot of that has to deal with the kind of clients that I am dealing with. Um, I deal with a lot of clients that are fairly high end and, um, we have, so my av just so you guys understand my average, um, estimate and my bid, and you guys are going to think this is crazy. takes 45 minutes to an hour to do. And it's because I go over everything that they may expect. Okay. Go over everything I can and communicate it to them. And then we talk about it and, you know, I read people like how they're kind of reacting. And then I touch on things that I think might affect them, like what they're worried about. And I try to explain every single possibility potentially that could occur so that when we do the work, they have an idea. Okay. And that actually helps a lot. I have very few difficult clients because I spend so much time communicating with them. And when my other difficult challenge that I have is that I deal with, I didn't get there fast enough. Okay. So I am a small company. I run as on average two to three crew members, myself and two other people. And the scenario there is that I um, do what I consider to be high-end work and I try really hard in the pruning work and stuff and I sell the business and the work as me selling it, talking to the client and being there on the job site and 90% of the time doing the work myself. And if I'm not in the tree doing it, then I am on the ground supervising the guy doing it. Like I let a good climber climb and do his work, but then I review what he's done. And if there's certain things I think need to be redone for pruning, because that's, um, 90% of what I do is pruning. Then I let, I tell him, okay, what about thinning that a little bit more and get those three branches in this just because I'm the one who spoke to the client. I know what they're expecting and they know what I told them. Right. And it saves a lot of work. But what that does do is it makes my bid times subject to change a lot because it's just me. Plus it's only two of us. So equipment breaks down. I get days behind and sometimes I'll tell them six weeks and it won't be until 10 weeks before I get to the job. Fine, whatever. But I hardly ever lose a client. Like I've had a couple of times where they went with somebody that was faster, but they were almost always jobs that I wasn't really stoked on doing because I was, I was there. Maybe it was a neighbor. They saw me work and they say, Hey, can you come bid it for me? And they kind of wince at the price to begin with, and they're kind of difficult and whatever. And I can almost tell they're going to be problematic to begin with. I try to get to them honestly, but at the same time, I'm like, well, if I lose them, they're probably going to be problematic anyway. And it doesn't really affect me that much. Um, so with the clients that are upset about it, taking too much time for me to get there. One thing I do to avoid that is I constantly try to email or call them or text them and let them know where they're at in my schedule. Yes, it's a lot of work, but it keeps high dollar clients on my books and keeps them from going to another client. It keeps me with a good rating on Google as well, because they feel like I am trying to communicate openly with them. A lot of people, all they really want is communication. It's not really about the time frame because most of these people, let's face it, unless it's like a broken tree that's about to fall on a house or something like that, or something that, you know, is potentially pushing down on their auxiliary power line and it's arcing or it's, it's putting too much pressure and they're losing power or it's in front of their satellite dish or something like that. Most people don't really care how quickly it's done because the tree's been like that for years. They didn't even think about it until somebody said something about their own trees or they saw our ad on the internet or they saw our truck drive by or whatever it might be, right? So really what most people want is just simply that we communicate openly with them, keep them up to date and show that we care about them as a client. That's why I tell my people, I don't have customers. I have clients 
And I think that's such a true statement. And you might say, well, it's the same thing, isn't it? Well, it's not really. And I've talked about this in the Elevated Office podcast before, because if you think about it, you would never say Walmart has clients, right? Walmart doesn't treat you like they're a client. You walk into the store, you know they have good prices, you know they have a product that you're looking for, you go buy it, and then you leave. That's what you do. But on the other hand, if you walked into a lawyer office to set up an LLC or a, a corporate company, and they treated you like a customer walking into Walmart, you would be shaking your head at paying the prices that they offer or re demand because you don't feel like you pay, you got anything that demands that price, right? I mean, seriously, that that's how it is. Well, so something similar happens in the tree world. A lot of guys think, well, I'm charging high prices and I should get paid high prices because of the danger of the work that we do and the equipment that's involved and all that. You're right. Not disagreeing with you. Here's the problem though. If you live in a town like I live in, or if you live in any city where there's some multiple of tree, quote unquote, tree service or tree guys out there, then what's going to happen is you're going to have a situation where they are going to simply go with the cheapest bidder. Because if you're going solely on the expectation that I'm a tree guy, I climb trees or I use lifts and I use cranes and it's dangerous work. And that's the expectation you expect the client to have. Well, that's the expectation they have for every tree guy. So if a guy comes in and bids $500 and you're bidding $2,200, they're going to be like, you're just overpricing yourself. Where really the $500 guy is the guy underpricing himself, right? We know that we understand that, but the problem now is that if you don't explain and show in some action what a client is getting from you, then they don't see a benefit in paying you extra money. But by doing all this, by this communication, by helping, by you know giving extra information, things like that, then they see that you're valued in their mind. Oh, sorry. Kick the camera. You're a value in their mind. And now they are going to pay you that extra money because you're worth it to them for some reason, man. What did I do? I messed up my cameras trying to get this out of the YouTubes. There we go. It's just going to be in the YouTubes a little bit. So, um, keep that in mind. Okay. The, you have to prove your worth and more than just climbing a tree that that's ex you trimming and climbing a tree is expected of you. That's what it is. So what is it that you're going to offer to them that makes you worth the money and also keeps them satisfied? So the best thing I was once told, the best gift you can give anybody is your attention. That's the most valuable gift you can give. Well, when I started my business, I found that I was trying to get to too many too quickly and I was charging less money trying to get the work. And what ended up happening was I disappointed a bunch of people. I had to do a bunch of favors and things just to make them happy. And I also realized that there wasn't much value in what I was giving my client. Okay. So what I started to do was spend more time on the bids help them see their trees as they are, help them understand my focus of tree work. And then I also started teaching them about the trees that they have. That's why it takes me 45 minutes to an hour. Jesse Cheney says, oh, by the way, I'm doing fine, Jesse. Sorry, man. Jesse Cheney says it's the same in the automotive industry as well. And he's right. It is. It's, a, it's this way in every industry. I charge more now and do less jobs and still make more money per year than I did when I first started out because I'm not chasing people and I'm not dealing with problematic clients as frequently. And I had one, she waited six months for me to get to her job. Okay. Different things, factors like snow and she lives up and it's hard. You know, um, I, I meant to get to it in three months and equipment broke down. Things broke down. Things happen. I'm a small guy. And, and some people say, why don't you start another crew? Well, I don't want another crew. My brand 
my work is built on my reputation, me. That's how I want it to be because that's what sells. They know that who they're dealing with is me. They know that who they're solving problems with is me, right? And I'm not saying that's how you should build your business. Each person has to make their own decision. That's fine. I'm telling you, that's how it is for me. I don't even have an interest in starting a second crew. But what does happen is that once again, can put me behind a little bit time-wise. So with her, it did. It put me behind quite a bit, just circumstance. I wasn't being lazy. I wasn't not working. It just didn't happen. Had a couple of emergency jobs in there as well. And emergency jobs do come up higher in my priority list because people, I, I think that people's emotions need to be respected. And the fact of the matter is, is that they're afraid. Maybe it's not a life-threatening emergency, but if a big top of a tree is hanging out of the tree, they're nervous about their dog, their, their kids, their grandkids, whatever it might be. So I put it up on priority, even though most likely all it's going to do is ruin their fence. Okay. I mean, let's face it. They don't know that all they see is a huge piece of wood coming out of the tree on them, right? That's what they imagine. So when I talk to them about it, I do put them up a little bit on the emergency list. I get to them and that does put some of my other clients behind, but Here's what happens when I got to my client been six months now and I told her I was going to get to it this week. It had been free of snow for like two weeks. We were without snow at all. Everything was melted. It was perfect. And I had a piece of equipment that broke down. I couldn't do the job brings me to the next week. And during the weekend, it dumped 18 inches of snow in her yard. So I just sucked it up. I said, you know what? She's waited long enough. I'm going to go and I sent my guy out there and he shoveled her yard so that we could get the tree out that she was worried about. Now we've shoveled it. We've gotten that tree down. We're going to do some trimming and I'm going to do a couple of ornamental fruit trees for free. And she's ecstatic. It's going to take me half a day to do these ornamental fruit trees. But now she's told three other people about me and how great I am as a tree guy, I mean, these are her words, not mine. And now they're all looking at having me do 3000 plus dollar jobs. So how do I handle problematic clients? Quite frankly, I treat them well. If they are so problematic that they just simply don't want to deal with me, I just say, well, that's as good as it gets. And at some point I just end the conversation I have actually walked away from jobs from time to time where people haven't paid me. It's not very common. I've only had it happen twice. And I was like, whatever, I don't even care. It's not worth fighting you for it. I could go, I have other jobs that are going to pay me waiting in line. I'm not going to fight you for it. You got to know when to cut the cord sometimes. And if you're not a big company and you don't have somebody who can chase down payments every day of your their lives, then You've got to make the decision. Are you going to spend days trying to find and knock on this person's door and get a payment from them when you have a job that you could just be doing? If it's a $500 job, yeah, $500 is not little. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to downplay money. But if it's $500 job and they've not paid me and I've tried four or five times and I have a $4,500 job sitting there to be done, why am I wasting my time on $500 three months later? I've already lost it. It's just the it's just the debt that's not coming back. So instead of chasing it, I've done my piece. I've done my try. I'll move on. That's it. Yeah, I paid out of pocket to get the job done. It's not fun. But am I going to keep shooting myself in the foot to do it again? I, I always learn. I think about the person, their attitude, all the indicators that they could have given me that told me they weren't going to pay for that job. And then the next time I run across somebody similar, I just don't take the job. So that's another thing. Um, I'm not desperate for work. I, I use a phrase sometimes. I don't know if I've used it with you guys. So um, please bear with me if I have. Um, first off, Jesse Cheney said, it's your reputation that they rely on. And he is totally right. So keep that in mind. Um, I use a phrase sometimes that says, desperate sales lead to desperate bank accounts. And what I mean by that is people who are desperate for a sell do everything in the book to get the sell. And all that does is make you pay. 
and your bank account just keeps going down and down and down and down and down because you're bidding too low, you're rushing jobs, you're breaking equipment, you're under, you're over promising and under delivering. Um, you do all of these things because you were desperate for that job. Okay. People read desperation. If you're desperate, they're going to treat you like you're desperate and they are going to take advantage of you. I hate to be negative. I hate to be cynical about people, but the fact of the matter is, is that there are a large portion, not everybody don't misunderstand. Not everybody. There is a large portion of the population that read desperation and they live on people who are desperate. JM Joss says 100% never quote desperate. I totally agree. I would rather go a week or two or a month without any work than go do a job just to pay my client or my guys to do it. I would rather pay them out of my pocket to do maintenance on stuff to keep my guys close to me than I would pay for them to do a dangerous job that I'm paying out of pocket for, that's not going to result in anything. Those people will not refer to you. They have no loyalty. They're just looking for the cheapest guy. And if you're not the cheapest guy the next time, then you won't be the guy that they use anyway. So don't quote desperate, please. All it does is bring the morale of your company down, bring the morale of your crew down, make you have a unsafe working condition as a general rule, because now you're pressured. You've underbid it. You've got to totally get this job done. And if you don't, you're going to end up losing out is how you're thinking of it. You're thinking money. That's all you're thinking about. Well, when we only think money, then the situation is we stop thinking safety. We stop thinking efficiencies. We stop thinking about reputation. Even though we think we're thinking about reputation, we're not. Money has overpowered all those things and that becomes dangerous. Yeah, Parkway Tree says eat before you did um eat before you bid like when you go to the grocery store hungry. That's it. Right? Um Spencer McGwork says sounds like how the big companies have to operate with such big overhead. Yeah. You're right, Spencer, it is. That's why when I started my business, I I really analyzed. So, I started my tree service business later in life, okay? Um not saying late in life. I'm only 39. But I already had tried different businesses and things. And I had seen, I had worked with a bunch of different service companies in different industries, not just in tree work. And I saw desperate sales and what it did. Almost always, it made partners upset with each other, made employees unhappy with their employers, made contractors constantly look for work outside of you. And it made clients and customers disloyal. That's what I saw. So I just decided not to do it that way. And you know what? It's done good. I'm not saying it's great. I'm not making the money that I probably should be making because I'm constantly upgrading equipment and things like that. I'm constantly, I'm pretty particular about keeping my gear up to date. So I have a lot of um, climbing gear expense because I like to renew stuff uh, just for safety factors and things. Uh, I know a lot of guys don't do that, but And I do shoot myself in the foot sometimes and I go do work extra for people that are upset to keep them happy to get that paycheck if I can. But if I have a long list, a long line of work, sometimes I'll just cut off a couple of hundred dollars off the job if it's a big, big deal. And it's the difference between me getting paid $1,500 for the job or $1,300 for the job for me to just walk away with the money in my hand and get on to the next job that's going to pay me four or five or $6,000, which I have a number of those. I just take it and go. I don't make it a habit. Understand, it's not a habit. I do everything I can to begin with to avoid that situation. If it happens, I just cut my losses where I need to and go because I can always make it back. Jesse Cheney says, if you back your product or service wholeheartedly, you will succeed. I agree. Um, so once again, treating my my clients like clients, if they have questions after the job's done, they call me. When I have a free moment, I stop by and look at it and explain or whatever. Most of the time, 90% of the time, it's not even about the work that I did. 90% of the time, it is about something else on the tree that happened, wind breakage or whatever. And they will actually have me come do the extra work. In the last two years, I have had probably 
10 or 12 clients call me back two or three times on their property to do work. That's a high number. Most tree services that I'm talking to don't get callbacks for extra work that frequently. Um, it's, it's not because I'm special. It's not because I'm a better arborist than you guys that are watching this channel. I don't think that at all. It's just the way that I do the work. It's just the way that I manage it and they trust me and now they like me. And I mean, I had a client the other day, he had knee surgery. I drove by his house. I was on the way to another job. I called him up and just asked him how his knee was doing. I could tell when I called, he thought I was going to ask him about tree work because it's an ongoing client. I have work that I do every other month for him whatever. Cause you got a big property. He's got a lot and he can't afford it every month or all at once. So whatever. But he was like totally stoked that I just called to ask him how his knee was doing after the surgery. I mean, I didn't think anything about it. I just was genuinely interested. And what do you know? He's like, Hey, yeah. When are you going to come by and do my work? So he asked me, you know, <laughs> it's, I don't know. Um, treat people like they're important and you will have a lot less issues with, with your clients. That's, that's all I can say. I'm not, don't, don't let them run you. You can't do that. You have to learn how to manage people, but there's a way to manage people in a good way. And there's ways that you can manage people that irritate them and make them work against you. Try to figure out how to work your clients in a good way. It sounds bad, but the truth of the matter is part of human socialization and all that we do is learning how to manage people. We have to learn how to manipulate people in a good way. Manipulation isn't always a bad thing. If you look at the definition of manipulation, it's working something into a form or shape that you need as desired. It's something along those lines. I'm not quoting it. I'm not reading the definition, but it is that idea. So when you're dealing with your clients, work with them, but keep them under control because you are the professional. Or at least you should be. Parkway Tree says, do you get the customer to look at the work during the process? like halfway through or just before you get out of the tree. Um, Parkway, that depends. It really depends on me. Um, depends on how important the tree is to them. Like I have one client, um, her deceased husband uh, planted the tree when it was on, it was like a anniversary gift or something. I mean, it was just part of the gift. He, he planted it and said, I dedicate this tree to you kind of thing. And that was like, 30 years ago and, and he passed away and now she's in her eighties. Um, so yeah, in that case I did, I had her come out a couple of times because like just talking about the tree, she teared up and she was were really worried about how it would look. And, and so, um, in that particular situation with the tree, I always make cuts and pruning, um, situations that are to my knowledge and my experience best for the tree but I always balance it heavily with aesthetic, how the tree will look when I'm done because to her, that tree meant something. It wasn't just a tree. It was like sentimental, right? So for that, I, I had her come out a number of times and we talked about it before I took any like larger limbs off of it, which it had a couple that were crossing and things. I asked her because ideally the, the crossing limbs would have been taken off, but she was afraid that it would look too, um, too, it would have a big gap in one side and two off balance. So I left it and I just trimmed the ends of it. So it had less weight did separate the branches a little bit, but they're going to grow into each other again. But she just frankly told me, I mean, I think she's in her late seventies early. 80s. She's like, by the time that happens and those branches die, I'll probably be dead anyway. And she didn't care. She just wanted it to look good. So, um, yeah, sometimes I do. It depends. Um, I've gotten to the point though, with a lot of my clients, they just tell me you're the expert, you go do it. And they're not even there. Um, they, I mean, my clients are to the point with me, by the time I get on the job site, I've talked to them so much and stuff. A lot of them leave me their keys to their home, which I never use, or they leave the house unlocked. And I'm like, uh, uh I ain't going in. I don't want that liability. <laughs> um, just so you know, I don't, I don't go in our, our guy, unless they're home, we don't, we don't go in at all. Um, especially with the COVID junk and all of everything. I'm just even more hesitant, but yeah, I mean, um, but it's because of the way I try to treat them, to be honest, it's, it's just that open communication. Um, also uh, something that I do with a lot of my clients is I have them do work that they can do that. I don't, they don't need to pay me for. I understand money's tight for people. It's tight for me. Um, we're trying to buy a house, 
you know, and it's, it's not easy, especially where we live. Um, the, the economy is very reverse here. You have a lot of retirees that have moved in that are living, they moved, they sold property in California or the Northeast, um, no, in the Northwest, something like that. Um, and they move out here on what they sold their property for. And they kind of have a, a small, relative small retirement. And then what happens is they are trying to live the maximum of their life, but not on a really high income. So, um, property is really high out here. Um, for, because of that, they come in, they see a house three times or twice the size of what they had with land and it's cheaper than what they had. So they buy it and now they've sunk all their money in their homes. So they just don't want to pay as much for services as a general rule. Um, and that's how it is across the board. So we have to work within that, but, um, yeah, I, I just walk up and I look at their yard and let's say they have, uh, some, fruit trees, very common to have fruit trees out here. And then they have some big canopy trees. Well, if the big canopy trees have a bunch of dead wood, but the fruit trees need a little of attention, I ask them, do they feel comfortable doing certain things on the fruit tree? And they say, yeah. And I teach them how to do it and let them do it. And they're so thankful that I spent 30 minutes teaching them how to cut off a branch safely on their fruit tree to make it healthier that they recommend me to a whole bunch of other people. And I've had a guy, I had a guy, um, left me a five-star review on Google, which I'm super thankful for. And he called me out. I drove out to Ure, which is about an hour from here and looked at his trees. He was already a previous client when he lived at a different house and insurance told him after he moved in the house that they wouldn't cover his house until he got the branches off the roof. Well, all the branches that he needed to be off the roof were short. They were like two foot long and they were all Aspen branches, which aren't very heavy. And he's a young guy. And I asked him, I said, can you do it? He said, yeah. So I helped him pick out the silky pole saw he needed to do the work. I showed him how to do it and he went and did it. Now he's mentioned me to like four other people. So I missed the opportunity for a $600 job. But now like three or four other people have called me and I have a, about a two in two out of every three approximately. So two thirds, um, sales rate for people who come to me referred by a different client. So yeah, I lost the $600 job, but I gained way more in the, the work that was referred to me. Um, so it, it, I don't know. It's just the way that I do things. I, maybe I'm wrong. It's working for me though. Um, they don't feel like I'm taking advantage of them is the key point. I think, um, most of them feel like I'm seriously, interested in them and I'm looking out for their finances as well. Now, that being said, I'm not the cheapest guy in town. I'm probably one of the most expensive. I've said that before and I'll continue to say it because I charge for what I do, but I don't nickel and dime all my clients to death for things that I know they could do. Now, some of the older women, some of the older gentlemen, they just can't do it and I'll do it. But a lot of times, if it's only going to take me an hour to do it, I'll just do it and give it to them as a gift, you know? So, um, Mark Weber says life, limb and property. That's what I tell my clients. Yeah. You know, um, I, I, I definitely don't do bad work for them. Epic journey says, what do you charge a man hour? Um, so Epic journey, I don't charge man hours. Um, I have a basic day rate that I, I know I need, but that changes too. It depends on how far it is from, um, it, it <laughs> Hector Cabello says, no entiendo nada, pero saludos. So he says he doesn't understand anything, but he's sending, um, salutations, I guess, or saying hi. Um, yeah, so I don't really charge a man hour. I, I know, si, si Hector, sé que está de Yankee Um, but I, I, I have an idea of what I need per day and depending on where they're located at, how hard it is. So I adjust for a bunch of different things, how sketchy the tree is, of course, um, how much hazard there is under the tree, because to me that relates to time and potential breakage, uh, for rigging and all that stuff. Um, how important the tree is to them 
and how sensitive the tree, like linden trees are really sensitive. So I charge a little bit more for those because they can get disease real easily. Um, and then I have to deal with other things. Um, if it's a centerpiece tree, then a little bit more because I'm going to spend more time being nitpicky on it. Like I had a, a crab apple recently that was a snow flowering cra crab apple. And um, she really liked this tree. It was like in the centerpiece of her garden. And she had won a bunch of awards for her garden in, in the area. Um, and I just was like, well, uh, I'll do it. But I mean, I charged like this crab apple was maybe 15 feet in diameter and 20 foot tall. And I mean, I charged like a full day's rate on it because it took me a full day with pruning shears and loppers and my, my, um, fine tooth silky and, you know, really trimming it to get it to where it needed to be. And then she came out like six times. We talked about it and I lifted areas and I reduced areas and I did things and, you know, but that's, that's what I did. Epic journey says, um, you have to know what you need to make an hour, then add on to it for wood and stumps. Well, I know what I, I know what I need to make a day. Um, so I don't even worry about hours uh, for me. I just get the job done for that. It, it, that's how I do it. But yes, I add on for wood and stumps. Um, if they're going to keep brush, if they're going to keep, uh, wood, I do give them a discount on all of that, but that's very dependent because it's, it depends on the side of tree size of tree and things. Um, Jesse Cheney says you're absolutely doing the right thing. Sometimes giving something for something or giving something for nothing gets people to come back. It's all about the PR. Very true. Um, it has that you have to be limited with that. The add-ons as they're called by a lot of people, by your clients can be overwhelming and they'll take advantage of it. So you have to know when to stop. So keep that in mind. Um, it's, I, I don't like formulas. A lot of people use formulas for certain things. I know what I need, um, to pay a month. And so far I've been way over that. Not, I will, I wouldn't say way over it, but I've been more than sufficiently over it. Not to really worry about getting into, um, things. Um, Epic journey says here in NC, we have to, we have to at least get a hundred per man hour for pruning. We usually get 150 though. That is your day rate. Yeah. I mean, my day rate equals out to about $185 an hour approximately. Um, but that's not always, uh, the case. It just depends on the situation. I, I have charged up to $250 a man hour. Um, when you look back at how many hours it took us versus the money paid, but I, I really just look at the job and I get a feel for it and I tell them how much I, uh, so on average, my, my day rate is about for two guys about $1,500 on average. So, um, just, but I work shorter or longer days and it doesn't change based on. So here's another thing. If it's a multi-day job, like let's say that, um, let's say that it's big, big work and it's a multi-day job and I expect it to be six days. And I have a lot of those because a bunch of people out here have like a, a driveway lined with old cottonwoods that are like a hundred years old, 80 years old. So they're really big, like 80 foot with a 45 or 50 foot canopy, lots of big deadwood in them. Usually there's um, cattle fencing under it or some other um, antique ornaments. A lot of people out here, because of it being the West and high desert, it's dry. They use, um, what's it called? They use a lot of old um, like steam engine equipment and stuff like that as yard ornaments. And, um, that has, you know, you it's rusted and stuff. So you have to be really careful. It's fragile. Um, but I'll tell them if I get it done in four days, they get it, they get the difference. They get a discount because I've already charged enough for the days that I did work, you know, with the bid that I, I placed that if I don't get the extra two days, I already have line work line or work lined up as a general. I mean, last year I was on average 12 weeks wait period for me to get to jobs. So yeah, I, I haven't been lacking work, um, to be quite frank. Um, so yeah, if I could just get away from developing new product and testing stuff, I wouldn't spend so much money. Uh, most of my money goes to testing equipment and developing new equipment. I'm, I have like three different devices under um, development right now uh, that I'm working on and it just takes money to do that. So 
Uh, Mark Weber says A300 pruning standards. Yes. Um, N0251 says any book recommendations? Um, well, you know, this is going to sound funny, but the ISA study guide is really good. Um, I like that one. And um, Climbing Arbor, uh, no, sorry. Educated Climber has the, oh, I forgot what the name of it is. Everybody calls it the Bible of tree work. That's really good. It's $25 or 20 bucks if you buy the digital version through um, Educated Climber. Definitely go check that one out. It's really interesting information and it can really help, you know, build you in your, uh, your tree work and your pruning ability. Um, I read a lot of, um, uh, uh, I, I read a lot of like garden articles, um, for master gardeners. I, I find that it actually really helps because the relation between the trees and the soil and, um, stuff like that is really a big deal. So uh, Andrew E. Bolger says, are you currently looking for any help? Um, depends on where you're at and what you're willing to do, what your experience is. Why don't you, uh, find me on Facebook and you can, or Instagram and send me a message, Andrew, that would be better. Um, Parkway tree says tree work is not lean manufacturing. You should try to get away from an hourly rate. I, I actually agree with that. So, um, Ian zero two five, thank you for the info. No problem, man. Um, the, the fact of the matter is, is I was actually in corporate manufacturing for a number of years. Um, and that's where my safety training comes from as well. I was the safety coordinator for a, um, fortune 500 manufacturing plant. And I was the one that got to negotiate with OSHA when we had fines and had to put all the OSHA standards in place and no, 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 no. And I am so glad that I'm out of that work, but it did help me learn a lot. And if you're trying to do an hourly rate only, it doesn't really bode for good tree work. In my opinion, that's just my opinion. You should know, you should have an idea of what basic tree hourly rates are though, that you need, but I don't think a standard hourly rate for every job is the way to bid a job in my opinion. Um, and, and I've seen this to be the case because a bunch of guys here and online that I've talked to, they have pulled off of jobs halfway through because they did an hourly rate. Um, to end up only finding out that they bid the hourly rate they had set, but the job was way more complicated than they had expected. And it, it didn't work out to the bid price in the end. They ran out of money essentially. Um, I have my own thoughts on that. I've never pulled off on a job. I've paid out of pocket to finish a couple of jobs because I bid wrong, but I've never, ever, ever pulled off of a job without finishing it. Even if it's just me taking out money out of my savings or whatever to pay the guys. Um, I think, uh, it's just personal once again. And I am a small company, so I can afford to do it more so than like a large company. It's just bad for your, your public relations. If you do that, in my opinion, I I'm not saying there aren't certain situations where you might have to keep that in mind. I'm not trying to tell you you're doing wrong with your business. I'm just telling you my perspective on it. Okay. That's what I'm saying. Um, Andrew E. Bulger says, how scary was it leaving a job like that to, to starting a tree service, knowing the risk and rate of failure. Um, I don't know. It wasn't really that it wasn't. So you have to understand, Andrew. Um, I had already quit that job. Uh, my wife and I spent almost 10 years or no, I'm sorry, almost eight years in Chile, South America. And I left my corporate world job to go live in a foreign country. So coming back to the States and starting a tree service company wasn't a big deal to me. It was just another thing in life. And, um, you know, just how it goes. Um, so yeah, I could see where it'd be scary, but I, I came into it very differently. Um, we had very little debt because we had paid off most of our debt when we, when we left the U S to go live in Chile, South America for a while. Um, so, um, what was, so Andrew does ask, what was your first setup? Just a trailer? Um, no, uh, it, it did. Well, so my first setup was a pickup truck that I did not like and hated and felt so embarrassed to drive around. 
Um, epic journey? No, I never tell a client a minimal man hour rate. I tell them a minimal base rate. This is my rate to do this work, and that's it. Um, and I just, I and I almost always make money. It's very, very rare I don't make money. But I, yeah, I'll just tell them, look, you want that done? It's five hundred dollars. And if it takes me two hours to do it, then I just made two hundred fifty dollars an hour. Um, it's just how I do things uh, because I've tried the hourly rate thing and equipment breaks and things break. I do what I, I look at the and I evaluate the situation and then I I make a decision based on that. It's just how I do it, and I'm I'm doing pretty good with it. So I, I'm not judging you, Epic Journey. If that's how you do yours hourly, do it. If it makes you money, if it works for you, I find that. So here's why I don't do hourly rates. Um, uh, hold on, Andrew. I'll get back to you in a second. Um, hourly rates to me make people sketchy. Um, like not you, but the client, they feel uncomfortable. Um, they don't know how to relate what, so like, let me go back. Um, I had a, I had a guy that I used to work with. Nice guy. He only did day rate. He wouldn't do hourly rate. He did day rate. And if anybody asked, he'd say, well, that equals out to about whatever, but it was true. It was only an approximation because he, um, if it took longer, it would, we would just stay until the job was done for that day. If that makes sense. If, if equipment broke down on the job site and we had to fix it, then we'd have to come back the next day and just make up the different, um, I mean, don't tell out. I, I'm sorry, Epic Journey. I, I'm. I just am a little lost with your statement there. It says, "LOL." I'd, I mean, don't tell hourly rates. Um, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding you, Epic Journey. If I am, please forgive me. I'm not trying to. I just didn't understand your statement. Um, but anyway, the problem always came down to this. Okay, just so you guys understand, they would say, "Well, what's your hourly rate?" And he'd say, "Well, we don't do hourly rate. We do day rate. Our day rate is this." Okay. The next question every single time out of their mouth was, well, how much will you get done in that day? See, people don't understand how to relate the money they're paying you to the work being done. They're afraid you're going to come in and make four cuts and charge them $1,500 and leave. And then they're like, well, that totally wasn't worth it. Or they're afraid they're going to pay you $1,500 or whatever, $1,200, $1,100, whatever for a day rate, whoever you are. And you're going to come in and you're going to um, get half the tree pruned. And now because they only wanted to pay one day, they're going to have a half pruned tree. Okay. And that's what they're hearing from us. All right. Just so you guys have that in mind. That's how people, and I've asked my clients, I've asked neighbors, and that is how they interpret it. They interpret it to be, I don't know what I'm getting for the money I'm paying you. Whereas if I do a bid, it's not an estimate. It's a bid. I tell them, this is what you pay to get that job done. If I underestimate my hours to do the work, then I lose. If I overestimate a little bit, I win. And that's just how it goes. So I like that method for me personally. Okay. That's all I'm saying. And then the customer has a definite understanding of what they're going to get. They know that if I said $1,100 to prune this medium sized cottonwood tree or $1,500 or $2,000 to prune a large cottonwood tree or whatever it might be, that if it takes me three days and I thought it was going to take a day, they know they're getting, they're going to get paid. I mean, they're going to get the job done and it's on me. Now I do always have a contingency in my, in my, um, I do always have a contingency in my contracts that say that if there is unexpected extreme hazardous conditions, like the tree is split way up there and I couldn't see it with my binoculars from any angle or the tree is unstable and I can't do it the way that I had intended to do it, then all work will stop we will reconsider the value of doing the tree work and the equipment needed and come to an agreement before the work is completed. And they will only pay 
for the work done up to that period. I do have that contingency in there because especially with these cottonwoods, they've been topped so many times here in town that I get a lot of situations where I'm on an 80 or 90 foot cottonwood and um, it's completely hollow and you can't rig on it like you normally would. And then I have to reevaluate what I'm going to do. Now, sometimes I can make it work anyway. 90% of the time I can. Every once in a while, I have to go get a bucket or I have to go get, you know, a lift or something like that to do it because I only climb um, as a general rule. And then there's more equipment costly. In that case, as a general rule, I only up the price based on the amount of cost for the equipment. I just re I just bill my client exactly what it costs me to lease that equipment to get the work done. I'm not trying to gouge or take advantage of people, right? That's just how it is. Okay. So I've got a bunch of questions from Andrew. Thanks for being a participant, Andrew. Um, what was your first setup? Just a trailer. Um, actually it was just a pickup with climbing gear. I ditched the junkie truck really quickly for another truck. Um, done, ditched that truck really quickly and went on to, um, I was actually, so surprisingly enough, my third and best setup, well, not best, but my second best setup was my, um, Toyota four runner with a small flat deck trailer for a while. Um, I was just working by myself. I was climbing everything by myself, um, doing everything by myself. Uh, when I went to get a helper and have a groundy as a full-time, you know, with my, my work, I only work about three or four days a week in the field because I do so much other stuff like the, the marketing and all that stuff. Um, it, it product development and product analyst stuff. Um, so, uh, with that, I went from the, um, forerunner with a flat deck to the forerunner with a five by eight dump trailer, which is what I still run because, um, here we have really tight, narrow areas between houses and fences. Um, and I didn't have a mini skid or anything. And that trailer has been awesome. I'm probably about to sell the five by eight though. And I'm going to get a six by 10 because now I have the Vermeer stump grinder, the SC 30 TX, which I put forks on and different things. I have different attachments for it now. So it doesn't matter if I'm as close to the tree as, as I want to be. Um, I can have it parked out in the driveway or the, the, the road, and I can drag brush with the, um, the SC 30, uh, with the forks on it and I can haul wood with it, which, um, it's not the same as a mini skid. And I'm not saying you should buy that over a mini skid, but I already bought it. I hate the thing for stump grinding. It does. Okay. But with the other attachments, the $9,000 I paid for the stump grinder, plus the 1500 I've paid for the attachments I've custom built or had custom built, it's totally worth it. I couldn't have bought a skid steer that does, you know, this does two thirds of what a skid steer would do. And I couldn't have bought a skid steer for near that price. So for me, the economics were just, I already had the piece of equipment, make it work. So it's working for me. Um, that's so I have a Dodge 2500 with a Cummings, uh, 5.9 liter turbo diesel. Currently, um, I have the cargo slide rear slide out deck. I built a custom wood slide out on the top. So I have a two tier slide out. I have an ARE camper shell with the back door that it, the back gate lifts up and as a door, I bought that used for $250. I'm about to spend $150 painting it with bed liner to seal it better and things. Um, and I have all my chainsaws and stuff, uh, and my climbing gear. So, um, yeah, that's what I've got set up. Hopefully that helps you, Andrew. Um, how big are you planning on growing your level of equipment? Um, depends. I don't know yet. Uh, I, it depends on circumstances and what I get. Um, and will you get equipment first, then hope to find good operators or the other way around? Um, I don't want operators. So I only <laughs> buy equipment that I'm going to operate myself or a groundy. Um, so yeah, I'm not planning on getting anything big. Uh, just so you, you understand my perspective. Epic journey says, I was trying to say, I don't tell them the hourly rate, but as a business owner, you should know how much you need to make an hour. The only time I do day rate is when we do large HOA commercial. Um, I haven't, I know what I need per month. And if I make that per month plus, so I go on percentages. Um, 
I know what I need plus percentage. And I'm not going to talk about my percentages because that's personal expense. That's my house payment. That's my car payments. That's whatever for my personal life, my dirt bike, um, riding, uh, maintenance fund as well, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I, it, what you're doing is fine. Epic journey. If that's the way you do it, but I don't do it that way. And it's successful for me. So it may be hard for you to understand, which I can understand that, but, um, I find that life is too fluctuating for me to run. So my prices change, um, through the year as expenses change and whatnot. Uh, I don't, and if I'm stuck on an hourly rate, I find that people tend to get focused on that hourly rate and that's what they go by. I don't do that. I just say, okay, well, my expenses went up this much. I need a certain amount of percentage over expenses to make a, a living the way that I want. And there we go. And that's, and then I break it down into how many days I plan on working that month and how many jobs I need to do to get it. And there we go. So, yeah. Um, also you have to balance that kind of with what people in the industry in your area are doing. Um, so like I, I can't go out and, you know, charge, let's say there's a guy in town, he's charging $3,500 a day. He's got six guys on the ground and it'll take him one day to do the job. Okay. So it's 3,500 bucks for the job. I can't go out and say my day rates $2,000 for two guys and it take me, you know, three days. Now it's $6,000 for the job. Um, the, the other guy can do in $3,500 job and he's pretty close, if not the same quality as I am. Right. It, it just doesn't, doesn't make economical sense to price yourself that way in the industry. So here's another, here's another secret to life guys. It doesn't matter what you want. It only matters what the economy can provide for you. So if you want to do this work, if you want to work in this industry and run your own company, but you also want a half a million dollar home and $80,000 pickups for you and your wife and everything else that goes along with it, but your, your local area isn't big enough to help that demand, well, you're probably going to be disappointed and in debt for a long time if not bankrupt. Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have nice vehicles and things. That's up to you. I have nice vehicles and things. Um, I'm just saying sometimes what our wants are versus what the practicality are in an industry aren't always the same thing. So we have to, we have to adjust with that. So, and, and that depends on area. I will tell you, um, I know for a fact, Denver pays more and they're five hours on the other side of the range. They're on the front range from us. We're on the Western slope. Salt Lake city has like California tree rates. It's crazy. I don't know why they're like way higher than we are. A, a tree that you might charge $1,200 to remove here would be like $2,600 there, 2,800 bucks. It's crazy. Um, but people pay it. But if I went out and bid $2,800 on that same tree here, I'd never get a sell. Uh, so you have to know what your your industry is it, what your local area is demanding. Southeast, unfortunately, seems to have lower tree work rates than like Pennsylvania. Um, I know guys in both. I grew up in Georgia. I grew up in Atlanta. Um, I have friends down there that own tree service companies. Um, so Desert Stomper says he, hey, I'm in SLC too. Yeah, um, we're in Montrose, Colorado. So we're just five hours east of you guys, uh, Desert Stomper. But yeah, so Salt Lake City, um, a friend of mine was telling me I should fold up company here and, and move everything over to Salt Lake City. I don't know. Um, I, I have a good clientele here. It's building. Montrose is growing like crazy. Um, oh, yeah. It's all right, Desert Stomper. I understand. Um, yeah. So I like it here overall. I like that dirt bike riding in the desert is like 10 minutes from my house. Um, I can go do epic mountain passes within an hour. Um, yeah. Desert Stomper says in Salt Lake city, it's pretty good rates. I like it here. I could see that. I, we've been to Salt Lake city. Pretty cool place. Um, we went to, uh, what is the, uh, snow, uh park, uh, park city. No. Is that right? Park city. Yeah. The, the snow skiing and the Olympic area for the, um, snowboarding, uh, half pipe and all that, which was really cool. 
Um, we went in the summer though. So there's a bunch of cool stuff you can do in the summer up there. Um, so, uh, Andrew asked, have you ever seen anybody get hurt in the tree? Or yeah, myself, <laughs> I've been hurt a few times in tree work. Um, yes, I have seen others get hurt in tree work. I've never seen anybody die yet in tree work. Um, but I've heard some pretty gruesome stories and seen some pretty gruesome photos of people that were there. Uh, so it's serious. Um, I almost, I, I legitimately almost ripped off my leg one day with a piece of rigging that went wrong. Um, and I have hyperextended my leg because I, uh, was in a rush and did something and just stupid. And it almost pulled me out of the tree, uh, because the branch got caught in my lanyard and, um, yanked me out of the tree. I, I, sh I shouldn't have listened to the guy I was listening to. I was just starting climbing. He was mentoring quote unquote, and he told me to do something and, um, yeah, wasn't, wasn't a smart idea. And the, it split and it peeled off inside my lanyard and my lanyard was wrapped around the pill and the whole, like, I guess it was about 25 foot long branch just snapped off with my, it wrapped around my lanyard and my lanyard yanked me out of the tree. Good thing. My lifeline was strong enough. It held me in, but it, my spike was in the branch. And because my spike was in the green sapwood or the cottonwood, um, when it pulled me, it pulled me sideways and my knee actually went sideways. Um, so that wasn't cool at all. Uh, the other one I'm not going to go into cause it's hard to explain and stuff, but I had a rigging piece that went off the wrong way. It was about five or 700 pounds. We can't figure out exactly pretty close to that. And it was not good. Um, my chainsaw actually saved my leg. Uh, I had a 25 inch light bar on it and it got wedged between the spar behind me and the stump of the spar that I was cutting off and the rope landed on the bar and it bent my bar. I have photos somewhere, but the bar was like at a 35 degree angle or something. It was crazy. Um, because it took all the weight of the, the rope and, um, yeah, that wasn't good. Uh, so, you know, it happens. You gotta be careful out there. Um, I did cut my arm one day with a chainsaw, not one handing surprisingly enough. Um, I don't know if you guys on, get, uh, can see that just that little scar right there. Um, the, the saw was in coast and I had a snap cut cut on a horizontal branch and it was holding and a guy decided to drive under the branch, not paying attention to the signs and road guidance. And I was in a bucket that was fully extended. I reached out, grabbed the branch as it snapped off, but the saw was in coast. And as the bucket bounced from the extra weight, um, I fell back and I didn't have time to get the break on because I had to reach out and grab the brain. It was like instantaneous. And, um, I grabbed it. And when I fell, my saw rolled over and cut my arm open pretty much down to the bone. But yeah, I just went to emergency care, had them stitch it up. They, all the ladies in the office said, I heard there was a chainsaw cut and they all came in and took photos, stitched it up. And I was back to work the next day. It's just how you do it. Um, do I worry about getting too old to make money in this industry? Um, yeah, no, uh, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of opportunities. Go back to a live I did a couple of weeks ago and I talk about what to do after climbing. There's a bunch of opportunities if you know how to build on them. So, um, no, not really. I mean, um, I, I, I am a contracted consultant for Weaver Arborist now. Um, I have a number of sponsors that, you know, help me out. I'm doing some training stuff coming up. So if you're listening on um, YouTube live, you guys won't know this. If you're on Instagram, you've probably heard me talk about it. Um, I am still, once the snow melts, it's just too much snow right now. Once the snow melts, I will start to um, go and shoot videos in the trees with my GoPros about topics, climbing concepts. So these aren't really training videos. They're not teaching you how to do um, safety stuff or whatever, but they're just talking about things that you might want to look at adding into your climbing uh, that I find to be efficient and um, create less fatigue. And then with that, um, we will do a live video like this and I'll be using a broadcasting system. So all you people on 
uh, Instagram, you're going to want to be on YouTube for that because I can't share the screen with Instagram. It won't let me do it, but I'll, we'll be talking about the concept and I'll be putting up video clips as we're talking about that specific aspect of the concept. So you guys can ask questions and I can, um, replay the video, rewind it, different things. And we can talk about it at that point. Okay. So keep an eye out on that Instagram. I'll be, um, informing you of those. I will continue to do the lives like I'm doing right here, but when I have to do those, um, concept climbing class, or I don't want to call them classes, but lives, then they will, um, you'll be better off on Insta on YouTube. So please go subscribe to my YouTube. It's Eric Jim Andes. I will put up, if you search Eric, what is it? Hold on. I'm, I'm typing something out real quick guys on um, YouTube. So don't um, give up. It's www.youtube.com forward slash E R I C J E M a N D E S. If I remember correctly. So that should, I just t texted it into, um, Instagram. It, that should be my, uh, YouTube live. So, um, go subscribe, please. And that way you'll get to hit that bell beside the subscription button and you'll get a notification when I'm doing this stuff, just so you know. Um, uh, Brian McGee, Hard to find steel 076 super parts. He's building a rebuilding a 271 carb now. Um, yeah, Brian, uh, talk to Lucas at justsenditsaws.com. He and Gary Buxton. Um, I'm putting it into the text here uh, on YouTube. He and Gary Buxton are always rebuilding saws and they can probably help you get those parts that you need, Brian. Okay. I'm going to put this into Instagram too. www. Just send it saws.com. Um, they are one of my sponsors, Brian, but just know I'm recommending them because I know they deal with that a lot. So it, it's not just that they're a sponsor of mine. It's that they are actually, um, rebuilders of steel saws. So, um, and they're good, they're good peeps. They, um, they really work hard to get you what you need and be reasonable about it. Um, I just put in their tag on Instagram as well. So yeah, hopefully that'll help you out, Brian. I, I really do. Um, like I said, good people. Uh, so I guess that kind of wraps up what we've been talking about today. I really appreciate everybody's um, comments and questions. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate all the, the questions uh, as well. I try to accommodate people as they have questions as we're talking and things. Um, just as a show of thumbs up, do you guys feel like I answered the question fairly reasonably about uh, handling difficult clients? Did I miss something that you want to hear about in the future? I'm giving. It's got a delay on both of these, so I'm just giving a few seconds to let you guys respond. Okay. Got a thumbs up. What about you, Andrew, Brian? Yeah. Okay. Um, Desert Stomper says yes. Parkway says yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Just know guys, I'm not trying to say what I do and what I'm telling you is perfect by any means. It's not, I'm not saying it's what you should do either. Okay. I mean, treating your clients like they mean something is always, always the best option. Um, if you treat them like they're important, within a relative degree, then they're going to respect you and appreciate you more, right? Um, treating them like you're not trying to rip them off and you're not. So once again, goes back to that topic I talked about before being a profiter versus a profiteer. Profiter is somebody like we all need to be who makes money. Um, we, we make money with our business. We're not just working to pay the bills, but we're actually making money for our families and ourselves. Um, a profiteer takes advantage of people and makes them feel uh, like they've been used for money only. Right. So 
that's that's kind of the difference and and keep that in mind but um yeah always remember that i'm giving you suggestions i'm not trying to tell you what to do i i'm not perfect and i'm not the best climber i'm not the best tree guy out there okay just so you know um i try to be the best i can be but there are guys with more experience and and have more successful businesses than i do so uh take my advice and think about it but i mean definitely check out like educated climber um, he does really good. Uh, Reg Coates, of course, has a lot of good detail information. He doesn't really talk about the business side of it too much, but he does have a lot of helpful tips about how to be safer and how to manage dangerous and difficult trees. Um, I'll talk about some of that stuff here in the future as well. Um, and uh, let's see. Justin at Saul's has some information on Facebook about... Um, saw maintenance and things like that. We're going to do an episode on that. And hopefully if I can get Sean, I didn't actually see a tattooed arborist on today. He must be busy, um, which is a shame, but if I can get Sean on, we're going to do a live, uh, video on Instagram and Facebook that is, uh, so that we can talk about equipment maintenance and rope maintenance. So he is a splicer for honey brothers and he, um, definitely, is um, qualified to talk about rope maintenance and things. Um, so keep that all in mind. That's stuff that's coming up in the future. Thank you guys for stopping by. I really appreciate it. If you don't mind, um, those of you on YouTube, if you feel like you know people or if you're in groups that you would like to share this video to, please, please do. It would help to get the word out. I'm going to do more of these on YouTube. This is just the first one. Um, they are about weekly, if not more than once a week. Okay. So thank you guys all appreciate it. You guys take care. Have a good night. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye.